Uh, so welcome everybody and thanks for coming. Um, so my first question to you is how many of you do work with AWS on your daily basis? Please raise your hand. Okay. Not so many people, so I will try to be as simple as explain the concepts here as simple as possible. However, if you uh, don't understand anything, just, just please feel free to interrupt me. The presentation is for you and, you know, I want to give you the whole idea. So, um, through the years, uh, a lot of company networks uh, become like a real, real stronghold. So we weaponize it with a lot of boxes like IDS, CM systems, DLPs, etc. And then there's the decision that we're going to cloud. There's completely no relation. So this, even the security team is not sure if, if their company is doing something in cloud. And, uh, it's often totally, uh, so, so the logs are not related with the, with the CM systems, no monitoring, uh, nothing. So I asked one manager whose <laughs> architecture looked like this and I asked him, aren't you feel scared of, of such architecture? Well, that's just a testing environment and our guys really know the stuff. And really know the stuff is pretty brave assumption. So basically, the access to, to their cloud infrastructure is protected uh, via the access keys. And those access keys can leak in various ways. The most common way, of course, is via the hard-coded code. So there were so many leaks, there are still actually, that uh, GitHub created a service that is called GitHub token scanning. Uh, so once you uh, commit hard-coded keys, then the provider of those keys will be notified and then you will get a notification from the provider. So in, in fact, you can do the same uh, experiment on your own account. So once you commit uh, hard-coded keys, then 55 seconds later, uh, about, you will get an email from Amazon that your keys are compromised. But this is the only, but the problem here that those keys aren't blocked. So you are just got notification. And after about two minutes, the first attempt of using the keys, uh, is happening. But as I said, this is not the only way, um, how the keys can leak. And finding the keys is just the beginning for the, for the attacker. And in this presentation, I want to show you what attacker can do with those keys and how to find it in other way than just in the GitHub repository. My name is Pavel Zepa. I work uh, in a company called uh, Securing. On my daily basis, I'm doing penetration tests as well as cloud security assessment. And taking my experiences and some of real stories, I created my own story for this presentation. So imagine there's a company which is a software house, um, and the manager was asked by one of their customer um, that there's a super lucrative project, but one of the requirements is building the, uh, this project on AWS. So the manager come to, to the team and ask about the expertise in AWS. So the team uh, said very honestly, well, we don't, we don't know it. We don't have ex experience in that. But some people cannot say no uh, to uh, when, when they say money, when they see money. So the manager finds, uh, find an idea that, uh, maybe we can build, we can, uh, uh, migrate our testing environment into cloud so people can learn on the, on the real examples, not like labs, uh, or uh, in, during the certification process. So, yeah, cool idea. Um, but the team said, well, maybe we should, we should think about it. We should plan it. Uh, we should do some trainings for our team. But, you know, there are, uh, 
currently there are a lot of people who are uh, super uh, who super believe in all those motivation quotes or the books about the success and the manager was one of them so the manager find on his facebook wall uh, the quote if someone tells you you can't they are showing you their limits not yours so the decision was made and then any argument was rejected by the manager. So the guys built some infrastructure. Um, they created the Elastic Compute Cloud instance, which is basically in AWS terminology, it's like the virtual machine in the cloud. So on this virtual machine, they built the continuous integration, they um, installed continue integration uh, application. In this, in this case, it is the Jenkins. Uh, and these Jenkins will be are responsible for deploying new virtual machines with provisioned new versions of the application. Make sense? And um, to be able for the, for the uh, Jenkins uh, application to deploy new instances of Elastic Cloud Compute instances, they have to have some permissions. So you can attach the role to the to this instance and give them permission to do to deploy new instances um, and those in, in this instance profile is kept in metadata also on the same on the same instance they also provision the, the first version of their uh, application so what is the metadata Metadata is the information about the, uh, about your instance. So all of internal addressing, uh, instance IDs, host name, etc. All of them are kept in metadata. Now, do you see anything special in the address 169.254? What is, what is, what is it, this kind of address? Huh, sorry? It's a link, link local address, actually. Yeah, link local address. What means it is, it works only in one network segment. So if you are, uh, if you are curling to the, to this address, HTTP 169.254, 169.254 from the ins, uh, from the inside of the instance, you will get all those information. But if you are give, if you are uh, trying to access this address from the other instance, you will uh, you will access this instance metadata. So only uh, you can you can reach the the content of the metadata only from the inside. And th this concept is nothing special for AWS because Azure and GCP uh, is using it also. What is more. Um, if you attach any profile to this instance, the security uh, tokens, the access keys and the uh, secure uh, token is kept also in this metadata on this URL. Okay? So, the story has also the dark side. And in the other end of the internet, there's the evil hacker man. And the evil hacker man found the application. So, uh, well, yeah, okay, yeah. So it's under the address domainanalytics.org. He found the application. Um, you can type the domain name or the IP address there, and you will get the. Um, this uh, security artifacts related with this uh, particular domain. So, for example, when you type uh, the one of uh, Polish government website, you you find that it is it is um, registered in Cloudflare and it expired in 2017. So it was no, uh, it shouldn't be any surprise that in February of this year someone. Uh, hijacked this domain and, and put pornographic uh, pornographic content. Well, as you can see, there's there's the parameter domain and the domain name or the IP address. 
What is more, if you know the, uh, the IP address, then you can check what, ser what AWS service is using this address. So for example, um, here, using the uh, AWS EC2 reachability test, uh, you can find that actually this web application is running on this uh, on the EC2 service. So, for for the evil hackerman, it was enough to try uh, find some vulnerabilities related with um, cloud. So. Instead of giving the domain address, he tried to put the metadata address because the source of the address was the instance, not the attacker, right? And one by one, carrying the, the next endpoints of metadata, he could get all those informations. And uh, so the, the vulnerability is called server-side request forgery, right? Uh, and the SSRF or RCE in cloud have totally new life. So he found that there's the EC2 role and the EC2 role and get the credentials for the EC2 role. Now, as I said, for the attacker, finding keys is just the beginning. So, to sum up, he found in the web application, which is hosted on EC2, he found the SSRF vulnerability, which allows him to get access keys from the metadata. Um, and this example wasn't, uh, it's not the lab example. Actually, it happened in real life. So there's this the website called fredcrowd.org, and indeed there is the domain parameter, and um, the, and the attacker put put the well, the attacker, the white hat attacker, uh, put the uh, address of metadata and got all the metadata content. So he reported it. Um, oh, there should be link. Ah. Um, if anyone is interested later, I, I can share the presentation, so there are all those links. So here should be the link uh, to HackerOne report, and guess how the people for, from FredCrowd, how they fix this issue? Any ideas? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, they, they simply blacklisted uh, this, this IP address, but... Well, uh, I think it's no, not, nothing new for, for the security guys that you can, that the IP address can be represented not only in decimal form, but you can also, uh, type it in, in hexadecimal or uh, binary and it will also work. So he got two bounties on this, on this bug. Well, but going back to the story, <clears throat> uh, when the attacker gained the keys, then uh, there's a tool called Paku, and it is AWS exploitation framework. Do you know Metasploit? Yeah, so basically Paku is uh, something like Metasploit, but for cloud, specifically for AWS. So you have a lot of modules, uh, which are, um, mo modules which are attacks, so you can just, instead of typing everything from command line, you can simply just uh, run, I will show you a few examples and the attack will happen. Uh, so, quick demo of Paku. Uh, it's written in Python 3. Um, you can name the session, so each session will be separated and the findings. And yeah, uh, so you can, you can list all the, uh, all the modules. Um, you can, of course, create your own. Um, and uh, all the findings are stored in the data, so instead to, to uh, avoid having the uh, mess on the console, you can uh, then you can refer to each finding, uh, and you can import the keys. So you, you, all the requests, all the attacks will be done uh, with the permissions of found keys. So let's import the keys. Uh, I name it EC2 pivot because you can import um, a sever several uh, keepers in the same session. 
um, yeah, let's set, set the set the region because uh, based on the IP address, you know not not only that it is related with EC2 service, but also which region uh, is used. <clears throat> and here's the list of um, of uh, the modules. So there are uh, modules for enumeration. There are separate modules for escalation. Um, as well as uh, exploiting some uh, misconfigurations. Let's not, don't call it vulnerabilities, let's call it uh, misconfigurations. So, um, using the PACU, you can enumerate all permissions if your role allows you to. However, if you don't have enough permissions, uh, you can always brute force each command and verify if you have the access to it or not. Uh, in our example, then the name EC2 role, uh, well, it indicates that probably it will be related with EC2, right? Uh, and it is super common, well, what I see when I'm doing cloud security assessments, it is super common that developers use this, the wildcard. Why? Because it always works. Uh, so... Instead of give the granular permissions to, to each account, it is much easier to put the wildcard. Nobody, nobody says anything. It works, right? So it's doing the job. Um, however, of course, it is, uh, in 99% uh, of use cases, this is, this is too much. So in Paco, uh, there's the EC2 Anum. Um, module for enumerating all the in instances which are reachable for these particular access keys. Um, and then you can, you can display all the data using data EC2. Um, but I don't want to uh, get you fall asleep uh, with all this uh, content. So the most important findings uh, during the enumeration was that there's one more instance which is stopped, but this instance had the pro attached profile admin instead of EC2 role. So, again, it is pretty indicative that this, this profile probably will be what the attacker should look for. So, um, we've, we have the EC2 permissions, but how can we access this instance? It is stopped. But even if we start it, how can we access the admin profile if we don't have SSH keys there? Any ideas? Hmm? Download the instance. Oh, I, I, I don't think it's possible in AWS. The snapshot, yeah, but... Um, Yes, uh, but then not only uh, EC2 permissions uh, are enough because you need to have uh, assume role permission to give uh, this admin profile permission. Um, there's a concept of user data in, uh, in EC2. So the concept is that you can specify a list of instructions that will, uh, will be executed on the uh, on the boot time, but the limitation is that all, it will be run only once. So, for example, um, you can specify there that uh, once the instance will be booted, then it will download all the newest uh, newest code, install uh, some updates, etc. So, pretty pretty um, uh, pretty nice feature. But of course, attackers can, can use it uh, for themselves. Uh, there's a nice trick in AWS that you can add the directive of, of cloud boothook on the beginning of user data. And if you do so, then those user data will be executed every time the instance is restarted. Okay? So... If you change the user data and with EC2 permissions, you are allowed to modify the EC2 attributes, so user data too, um, then you can simply 
put a reverse shell, the bash one liner, without installing anything from, from the external sources. And here you are putting uh, the attacker public IP address, and here the, the port number, uh, the, the port number on which you are listening for upcoming reverse shell. So, once again, you are getting the EC2 role, then using the EC2 role, uh, you are modifying the user data, you are restarting machine, and once the user data is executed, you are getting reverse shell, and you are king of the cloud. So, how does it work in practice? In Paku, there are just few clicks. Well, so let's use the exploit, which is called EC2 Startup Shell Script. Let's display the, the, the help to, to see what parameters it should take. Uh, so you are giving the script, uh, so to override us user data and the instance ID, uh, to know <laughs> which, which instance should be, uh, uh, should have overwritten user data. So in this terminal, this is the attacker terminal. Um, so, so there was displayed the, the IP address and this is the reverse shell which I want to uh, overwrite with user data. Now, I'm setting the listening port. And in other terminal, also on the attacker side, where, where, where you have the PACU session, you are simply running this module with the ref shell script and related with this instance on this region. So what you see is that the instance is stopped, the user data is modified because the user data can be modified only when the instance is stopped, and then you are starting it, and because of the Cloud Boothook directive, the user data will be executed. So here, you can see uh, that we are awaiting the, the Instance uh, is starting not, not so fast. Uh, those who work with, with AWS know it. So you ha we have to give it a little bit time. But then, bam, we have it. So we, we gain the reverse shell. And now, again, using the same trick of uh, accessing the metadata, we are getting credentials, but this time of the admin profile. Is it the end of the cyber kill chain of getting the administrator? Who thinks that yes? Please raise your hand. Indeed. Good, good. <laughs> That's the, just the beginning. So what the attacker wants is to remove his, his fingerprints, right? <laughs> um, in AWS, there's the cloud trail service, which is responsible for monitoring all the regions and all the API calls. So whatever your developer, whatever he will do, it will be monitored uh, by CloudTrail and it will land in the S3 bucket um, in the logs. But the attacker, with the administrator permissions, can change a little bit some flags. So for example, only the, the CloudTrail will be monitoring only one region. And if you do... In, uh, for example, if you set up the uh, crypto mining, uh, uh, the, the cryptocurrency miners in all of the other regions, they will be not notified only when the invoice come from the Amazon. Uh, of course, you can destroy the uh, S3 bucket or destroy the trail, but then it is uh, it is too loud because uh, most likely they they will get notifications that something doesn't work. In Paku, we have, uh, again, the, the, um, uh, the special module to enumerate all the monitoring services. So not only CloudTrail, but also CloudWatch, GuardDuty, etc. Uh, and as you can see, there are flags like include global services, like creating a new user. So by default, it is... Um, it is true, it's set to true. The logs are validated, uh, so if you destroy any logs, it will be detected by the cloud train. But using, uh, but using uh, Paku, you can minimize 
the cloud trail, what means you will change those flags. Include, include global service events? False. Is multi-regional? False. So only the EU West one will be monitored, and in a, any other region you can do whatever you want. Now, that's still not the end of the, uh, of the cyber kill chain, because now you, as an attacker, you need to have some backdoor. Of course, you can uh, keep the backdoor in user data, but it's, well, it's, you shouldn't relay on it, because uh, if the instance will be destroyed, then your backdoor will too. Another, another approach to set a backdoor is to use uh, the lambda. For example, if companies, they are using a lot of lambdas, uh, from my experience, it seems nobody is monitoring if new lambda is appearing and nobody gives a shit how it is called. If they are, if they are called pr pretty the same, then nobody, nobody looks on it. Um, and if you create lambda that, for example, some event happen, then, then uh, lambda will be triggered and, for example, create a new user for you and then you have access to the infrastructure. Uh, even better idea is using trusting policy. The access in AWS is built on policies. And trust me or not, but not, not many people are reading policies. They are pretty boring uh, documents. Uh, so once they are set up, nobody is verifying if, if they are changed. Uh, and you can use, for example, trust policy. So add, if, if there is a policy of role of admin, you can give uh, the permission that this role can be assumed by totally other account. So, for example, yours, the attacker's account. So the attacker's account can just type STS assume role and gain the admin to your infrastructure. Another idea is to create an additional keepers. Now, question to you, how many keepers can be created to one identity and access management user? How many? Unlimited? No. Two, yeah. So the idea behind it is that when you are uh, running some service and it uses keys, then for example, uh, those keys are compromised. So you want to change them, which is what, what is called rotation, key rotation. And if you want to rotate the keys, uh, in the, if it would be possible to set only one keeper, then you, you should uh, stop, stop the service uh, for, for the moment of changing. But if you have two keepers, then you can, uh, which, which work the same, then you can put there and then destroy the first keys, and the service is continuously running. So, um, again, in Paco you have a, a separate module for it, so you can, you just putting run IAM backdoor uh, user keys, and then uh, extra keys are uh, added to every user. And there's no, absolutely no notification that your user has uh, extra keys, um, and even in the dashboard, there's no notification. This is the Id identity and access management dashboard, and there's a column access key age. And when you see that this user has the five-day access key, right? Yeah, well, pretty okay. It, it even has the multi-factor authentication, so the um, begin, beginner administrator thinks everything is, is okay. But later, in the security credentials tab, you can see that there are two keepers, and the five days uh, is regarding the older keys, right? So nobody sees that there are two additional keepers for this particular user. And the multi-factor authentication is usually for just for console access. If you want to use the multi-factor authentication also for programmatic access using keys, then it, it requires the uh, special policy, which will deny any action if, if there is no um, EC2, if there is no multi-factor authentication enabled, which is pretty rare. 
So, how the story could end, that's, I, I'm leaving it to your imagination, but uh, there was one story, uh, there was a company called Code Spaces. Have you ever heard about it? In 2013, it was the um, raising alternative to GitHub. Uh, now nobody remember uh, this company, and I tell you why. Because the, they put everything, all the infrastructure on AWS. They didn't have any infrastructure uh, on their local servers. Everything was in cloud. Let's go to cloud, right? Uh, and then the root accounts were compromised, uh, and the guy, uh, the attacker, told them, "Either you will give me money, or or you will regret uh, of not giving me this money." And they checked the logs, and they really find this uh, compromised account. So they removed this account and say, "Now, now what?" And of course, he had the back door. And in revenge, he destroyed all the resources they had. And of course, they, they have even the backups they, they have under the same uh, AWS account. So the company stopped existing in just one day. Well, but could we, can we prevent such attacks? Of course we can. So the, the, the first concept is, um, the locking dynamically lock the credentials from metadata. So only the uh, using the metadata proxy, you can um, you, you it will be uh, injecting the session policy uh, with the limitation that to metadata that the meta metadata can be accessed only by uh, this instance with uh, IP of this instance, as well as uh, the VPC uh, ID in which this instance is run. So even if there's the server-side request forgery vulnerability in your web application, nobody can do anything with those keys. Uh, funny fact about this is uh, that the author of this solution is the William Bensington. Do you know this guy? He's, um, the, the security guy, he was the security guy from the Netflix, and then he became the uh, cloud security director in Capital One. And two months uh, after he gained this uh, position, there was the one of the biggest breach uh, in Capital One, and someone find the uh, vulnerability, the server-side request forgery vulnerability, gained the, the keys with the simple uh, with the S3 service access. And she uh, just dumped all the data from the Capital One. Uh, three months later, uh, someone someone uh, detected the attack only because the data was already published. So there was absolutely no monitoring uh, of such anomalies that someone is listing 700 buckets and then dumping all the content. So, yeah, think about it too. Um, the next, um, the next uh, thing you can do is uh, using the AWS organization, and it allows you to separate accounts. So the best practice is to use at least three accounts uh, under one organization. Uh, and for example, if your developers needs only access to EC2 or S3 service, you can limit the access to any other service using the service control policies, the SCP. So now, even, even if they uh, become any, any of your developer become the administrator, he can do, uh, he, he cannot uh, hurt you uh, much. All the logs are going uh, by the cross-account cross app uh, replication is going to the logs, which are stored under uh, second uh, security or auditor account. And then you can you can do nothing with logs. Um, again, the next thing you can do is uh, there there is the AWS uh, Center for Information Security Foundations benchmark, uh, which is generally the list of best practices you should follow. So, for example, there there are uh, there, there there are such such things like do not use wildcards. Do not open security groups for public access, etc. 
And you can, you can uh, check it automatically. There are tools. If you are interested, I can give you some. Uh, you, you can just automatically check uh, what is the configuration of your account. Um, and the final thing uh, you, you can do is set up monitoring. So if anything bad is happening, then you, sh you should have the automated incident response that will uh, block the account, that will notify your incident response team, etc. Now, can we, can we detect such issues? So in the cloud security assessment, I think we should follow the, at least those four steps, uh, which is the first is the architecture review. Um, so verifying the, the best practices in the design. So if you are using the AWS organization, um, if there is uh, the, the proper separation, if there is possible the uh, privilege escalation paths, etc. Um, next thing is the configuration review. So verifying if, if your uh, infrastructure is uh, actually compliant with uh, the CIS fun uh, AWS CIS Foundations benchmark. Um, and the, the separate, uh, pr the separate uh, step during this process should be verifying uh, the security of the sensitive services like the Lambda. Uh, so there's a totally new uh, attack vector like event injection, uh, verifying code of Lambda, uh, verifying uh, the security of applications which are running on our uh, infrastructure. And the final thing is verifying monitoring. Even if you, if you have deployed all the uh, security mechanism in your account and you don't have proper monitoring, you, you shouldn't feel secure. So for example, let's take again the Capital One. Um, I'm totally sure that there was, there was account which uh, had the access to the, uh, to, to all those uh, content of the buckets. Um, but this, this guy can, you know, can change, change his mind that he want to gain some extra money, uh, whatever, uh, his motivation is, but it should be detected. It should be detected that one of your employee, uh, consciously or, or not, uh, is getting all your sensitive data, right? Um, so to sum up, um, uh, remember about auditing your cloud infrastructure, verify it, uh, harden it, and then repeat. So it's, remember, it's like the continuous process. It's not like verifying one, once it's done, then okay. Uh, the best approach is to automate this process. So if uh, using, for example, AWS config, uh, that if any change is done, then it is verified. No, uh, and if uh, something is uh, not compliant with your own policies, then it is um, reverted back um, to the right uh, status. So, um, to give you, uh, in the end, to give you some some uh, materials, here is my uh, guide with uh, some of the best practices uh, in AWS. Of course, it's free. Um, it's like 11 pages, so um, not not big guide, but there are the most important ones. Uh, and also, if you want to play as a hacker, um, the, I've prepared the Capture the Flag game, which is uh, built on, on uh, our company infrastructure. Um, so there's also the walkthrough if you have any, any problems, but also you can, you can play and feel as an, as a hacker. If you want to have more open source materials to, to learn from the offensive security perspective, just, just let me know. Uh, drop me a mail and, uh, I will share it all. So. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and do you have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, in Lambda, Lambda is triggered. Well, uh, Lambda is triggered by events. Um, and uh, for example, one way of privilege escalation, if you are using the managed, uh, um, the Amazon managed permissions, 
there's a, a database uh, role, uh, the database policy, which gives you permissions only to create a Lambda, but not to trigger it. So you can create uh, create any kind of Lambda, but you are not allowed to trigger it. But using the event injection, you can create Lambda that it will be uh, triggered by the event by the event. So, for example, you are creating the database, uh, and you are creating the event of appearing an entry in this database. So you are allowed to create the database. You are allowed to put the entry there, and it will be. This will be the trigger of Lambda, which will be uh, executed. Even you don't have the permissions to do it, uh, but using those those events, you can. Another example is, for example, um, uh, the Lambda code is taking uh, the name of the um, of the S3 object and put it. Um, in the SQL statement, so the, the uh, you can name the the object with the uh, SQL injection, and it will be triggered. Yeah, examples like this. Um, Lambda is very often used uh, for the PDF generation or the uh, picture, uh, some modification of picture, and very often this code uh, was never analyzed <laughs> from the security perspective. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are, yes. Um, there, there are even the native Ada, uh, Amazon uh, solutions. So uh, the now currently the best practice the Amazon says is using the security hub. Uh, because there is no one service of monitoring uh, all the uh, security events. So you should have guard duty, you should have AWS config, you should have um, AWS inspector, you should have AWS Macy, and you should have uh, other services. And they, they found that actually uh, there are pretty much of those services, so how to monitor them? So they created another uh, service, which is called the Security Hub, to aggregate all those logs, and then you can, for example, um, simply uh, plug the CM system, uh, so w whatever incident response you are using in your company. Of course, you can create your own, uh, for example, regarding the uh, SIS benchmark. Uh, in just a few clicks, you can create a template in CloudFormation, uh, and you can deploy it so all the AWS config uh, rules will be deployed regarding the SIS uh, benchmark. And if any of your uh, b developer will, for example, uh, put the security group open to public access, you will be notified. Yeah, and you can, for example, like uh, get notification on um, uh, SMS, mail, whatever. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not the expert in Azure and GCP. I will be honest with you. However, um, there there are some drawbacks too. Uh, because it is related uh, with the human factor, because it's easier to set up the insecure environment. However, regarding the server-side request forgery, um, uh, in GCP and Azure, it is not so easy, because you have to add the special secret value in the header. And in Amazon, you don't have to, so <laughs> vulnerabilities like this work like a charm, uh, and in uh, Azure on GCP, it's uh, it's not so uh, not so easy. However, still, if you have uh, some kind of uh, remote code execution, you can do exactly the same. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't. I don't think so. It will be changed. It's like um, because Amazon doesn't see vulnerabilities in all of these things. So, for example, 
user data and uh, cloud bootkick directive, uh, they can be used by attacker, but the problem is Amazon always will tell you that, uh, well, those guys have access to, to your, um, to your, uh, infrastructure and they are using the, the features. So, you know, they, they don't see a problem here. Uh, there are a lot of nuances, security nuances. So, for example, um, the the phishing attacks uh, on the on the Amazon. This this is awesome, and I don't know why Amazon is not doing anything. Because if you click the Remember Me when you are logging to to the AWS console, uh, then this persist cookie will be this uh, will also work even if you uh, change the password. Right? Which doesn't make sense because, hey, I got compromised and the attacker, hey, I don't care because the persist cookies still work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy the event.